Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. I didn't actually know I was going to say anything. What was it, being ready for anything or everything? I don't know. And I've blubbed through absolutely everything so far, but then I probably did that 20 years ago. When we first moved here, um, we had a two-year-old, so very new to parenting, and our second child was born here. So to reflect back, we were away from family, and the church was our family. And with a church family, and any family, you have your ups and downs. So we've got lots of memories of some lovely things and some really difficult things that we dealt with whilst we were living here. But God was faithful through everything. Um, I think we're, we learnt a lot as well. We learnt as new parents bringing children up. But probably learnt to stand on our, when I say our own feet, we um, owned our faith for ourselves. We were both brought up in Christian families. But I think the hard part is moving away from your family. And suddenly your Christian faith comes into being, or not, as the case might be. But for us, we had a lot of prayer behind us. And we made lots of really special friends. I think our first visit, Paul and Gloria invited us for coffee after church. And it just went on from there with a Bible study group. And a whole group of tightly knit friends who are at the same, same stage as us having families. So it was a really, really special time. And then it was time to move on, and we moved up to Scotland. We've been living there for about the last 20 years. And pretty much the same thing, um, finding a church, finding a new family, being involved in the community, and I suppose in many ways being led by God. Our motto has always been praying for doors to open and to be in the right place and doing the right thing. And it's always really obvious when it's not the right thing because the door doesn't open or it closes. Um, But many doors have opened. We're going to be grandparents in November, our first grandchild. And both of our children are involved in church. Um, They're both working. They're both healthy, which is just great. Um, Yeah, life goes on. So it was a real privilege to be invited last night to the 40th wedding anniversary I was so excited about coming and meeting up with people. Lots of old friends were there and some friends who weren't there, which was sad. But lovely to touch base again, and it just seemed as though we'd never been away, to be honest. Um, Lots of laughter, lots of tears last night. But just really, really nice to be here and uh, to see lots of known faces here. And to hear your stories as well and how you've moved on. It's really, really exciting. Thanks, Sue. It's really nice to see you all. And um, thanks so much for your welcome. Do you have any idea how special this fellowship is? We had to leave. (laughs) But we didn't really know how special it was till after we left. So what Sue has said from her heart, I just want to tell you a few things, just to put that into context, if that's okay. But I want to remember a couple of things. I mean, Chowdean is full of humor, right? There isn't a church that I know of. And I want to just recall a story, and I'm, I'm going to just be a bit close to the edge here. But Derek, where are you? He's gone. So he, that's all right. I can tell the story then. That's fine. Because <laughs> many of you might remember that Chowdean had an electric organ. Do you remember that? And he got up one morning to speak to the kids. And he said, children, you see this? Uh, you, see, you see those organ pipes there? He said, they're false. He said, but when I was a kid, I used to get paid 10p to go and make wind behind, those, make wind behind the organ. And for the song we're about to sing, I had to pump and pump and pump and pump. <laughs> Derek didn't see it at all, but we were under the chair. And that's just a little bit of an illustration of the sorts of things that used to go on in Chowdean. What a fantastic place to be. And memories of cling filming... Um, Trevor to a lamppost and Anne came along to try and rescue him so she got cling filmed to Trevor as, uh, and then we had of course um, the police came up saying what's going on they posed for a photograph that ended up in the local paper 
And uh, when we went to Trevor Nan's Reading, they arranged for a mock IRA ambush for those of us who went in the minibus. And we still tell the story. In fact, I was telling that story to some people just a couple of days ago. I've lost my uh, iPad here. I'm going to just tell you a few things that I think you might find interesting. So it's 20 years ago this, this month since I left to go to Scotland for a job. And there was a tiny little advert in our professional newspaper. And for some reason, it hit me here. Do you know that? So I told my dad about it, and he said, well, pray about it, push the door, and see what happens. So guess what? I got the job. And we ended up knowing that after nine years here, it was time to leave. In that time, we'd had nine episodes of burglary or car theft. So we'd lived through some stuff while we were here. And we ended up going to Scotland. We thought, wow, this is it. But then it took us nine months to sell the house. We had a house all lined up, and that fell through. And then another house came on the market just as the other one fell through, and it was in a place called Mavis Bank, which means song thrush, for those of you who don't come from Scotland. And Sue had been really keen that we were in the right spot. So we were unpacking as we moved in. And I'd been to Jamaica teaching some orthopedic medicine over there, and we unpacked a Hessian bag, round some coffee from the Blue Mountains, which Ter Trevor, where, um, Terry, where are you? There you are, Terry. Best coffee is Blue Mountain coffee, okay? Okay, that's fine. And, yeah, it can be, it can be, I believe. But on the bag, the Hessian bag, it said, Mavis Bank, 100%. We arrived, having been in America on holiday, and James was really ill. He went to Dundee to be diagnosed, having had only 7% of his kidney left. And for eight, well, how old was he? He was six, wasn't he? For about five years, we'd been going backwards and forwards to the GP in Lowfell and just said, he doesn't want to go to school. But only 7% of his kidney was left. And guess what? The guy who pioneered keyhole surgery for the kidney was there to deal with us. So those are just two stories of many we could tell. But we have walked hand in hand with God over these last 20 years. So some of you don't know us at all. Um, and I just want to go to another story, which is that the pews, do you remember the pews being taken out of Chowdean? Our old house is up for sale at the moment. So we had a look on the website last night, and guess what? The pew's still in the hall. <laughs> and we took the front pew, they took the bench parts of the front, front pew with us to Scotland because it's just gorgeous, lovely wood. And that wood was made into a cross that hangs at the front of the Link Church in Dunfermline. It's been made into a beautiful Celtic cross. And that was the bench upon which many souls came to know the Lord. What a story, eh? James is 30 now, and he lives in Aberdeen with his wife, Jennifer. And Sarah was born within days of Rebecca and Amy. And, uh, you know, we always remember that being a really special time. So what have we learned? I just want to read something to you. In Samuel 3, 1 to 9, we read, Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel, and Samuel said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down again. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up. And he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And a third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up, and he went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, you called me. Then it was that Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli said to, to Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servants listening. 
So when God speaks, it's time to listen. But it takes time to recognize his voice. Because when we hear him, it's through our hearts, not our ears. God puts eyes in the front of our heads when it would be much easier if they were in the back. Why? Because as we look forward, we can't see. But as we look backwards, we can. We gradually learn how to trust, to let go, and to believe in God's goodness above all else. So our story took us, you, took us away from you for a time, but we came back yesterday after 20 years to pick up with friends as if only a few days had passed. Kathy Hood said, it's going to be like this in heaven. I'm sure if we had a glimpse, however, I wonder if Ken Manning would be standing next to St. Peter saying to everyone, time you had a haircut. <laughs> That was the first thing he said to me yesterday. <laughs> Does he say it to everyone or is it just me? It is everyone. Yeah, I thought so. So here we are. We're starting with yet another change. I've just been appointed um, to bring together health and social care across the whole of Perth and Kinross. And it's another God story where my head's back there and my body's here somewhere and I know I'm in the right spot. It's really difficult. But just this morning, we we're talking about God being a God of abundance at a time when we're short of stuff. We've got more older people, we've got less money, and it's more difficult to recruit staff. God's taking us into the middle of that. So you may, many of you might remember uh, David Jenkins. Do you remember David Jenkins, academic and controversial Bishop of Durham? You might remember his views on the virgin birth and uh, the fact that York Minster burst into flames shortly after his ordination. Well, I was working in Bishop Auckland at the time, and it was before we came here. And I met him in the hospital, and he struck me as being very ordinary, but something he said has lived with me ever since. He said, God exists. He has made himself known. Therefore, there is hope. Howard Jones may not realize it either, but he lent me a book, Proper Confidence by Bishop Leslie Newbegin. And he said, Leslie Newbegin said in his book, in order to win people, Jesus Jesus became like them. So Jesus is able to relate to everyone we meet, to meet them just as they are. And so we should be like that too. Sue and I have been called to a place in the market. It continues to be a roller coaster ride, high pace and no brakes. All we can do is scream at the scary bits and rejoice as we celebrate our survival. Faith is the belief that the engineer made it safe to ride. In conclusion, I want to share some words from the morning office of the Northumbria community that we're still members of. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. See that you be at peace and love one another. Follow the example of good men of old. And God will comfort you and keep you, both in this world and in the world that is to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The reason why Anne is uh, taking her time is that she actually broke her metatarsal foot bone a couple of months ago, so she's uh, cautious of stairs. Now, metatarsal uh, breakages are usually associated with fo football players, <laughs> so it's got nothing to do with how hard or where she kicks me. <laughs> but uh, Paul asked me um, last night... Uh, would I say a couple of words about where we have been and where we're going? Um, and it's a real privilege and it's a real honor to be able to speak in front of you of how much uh, Chowdine has meant to us in the past and how much it continues uh, to be in our thoughts to a point that when we heard about uh, Paul and Gloria's uh, Ruby wedding uh, party last night, 
we said that not only would we stay to go to that, but in the morning uh, we would use it as an opportunity to catch up with yourselves. And uh, here we are. So where does it all start? Well, I think underpinning all of this is a, is a verse in Psalm 130, verse 1. And it's a verse that I don't really have to say to you because my four boys sung it to you. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. We have so much to bless the Lord for. Uh, about 25 years as a graduate manufacturing engineer, I'd finished my course and I was about to start work. Now, with an accent like this, you would think that I'd probably start work in Northern Ireland or Harlem Wolf or Shorts or somewhere like that. But no, I was starting work in the northeast of England. And when I started work in the northeast of England, and when I, I graduated in the northeast of England, I found myself in Chowdean. And that finding myself in Chowdean wasn't an accident because within this fellowship, we were given the opportunity to do things, the opportunity to let God use us in ways that God would bless us. So blessing the Lord doesn't come just that we physically say thank you to God because as we open ourselves and as we do things to God, God actually blesses us. And it's not been a self-centered existence it's been a God-centered existence because when we give to God that effort, that energy, God will bless us and he has blessed us. So during that initial time, uh, we started getting involved in kids club. We were involved in uh, Bible studies. And uh, it sounds a lot of work while you're doing a, a full-time job. But one advantage that we had was that we didn't have any kids. Now, initially, I didn't even have a wife. <laughs> but then uh, Anne came over, and uh, we carried on going out. And uh, we got married. And some of the escapades you heard about in terms of cling film and uh, uh, honeymoon and uh, buckets of water over Paul. <laughs> but... Uh, it was all part of what God uh, was doing as a family here. And I want you to re realize again how important it is to have that family. Uh, because God's family just extends. There's a verse in Jeremiah that talks about when we belong to God and when we're God's people. God has a plan. And he's got a plan to do what? To give us a hope and a future. And hope has been mentioned quite a few times this morning. And that hope is something that is not out these walls. It's a hope in God that lasts forever. And part of that forever is actually the future. The future, as our pastor at the minute says, is glory. And when we grasp what our future is, what that glory is, then everything else goes into perspective. And that's a really, really exciting thing as a Christian to, to grasp hold of and to move. So over the seven years that we were part of Chowdean family, we grew, we developed, we did things that... Uh, uh, were probably not right at the time, but they're part of growing up and developing character. And when you're given the opportunity to develop your character, you'll make mistakes, but you'll also learn. And as we moved back to Northern Ireland, uh, we went back as a husband and wife, stronger and more committed to what God would do to us and through us. So it's no surprise that in our following fellowships, we've been involved with kids. Uh, we've uh, been involved in uh, studies. And we've seen God really bless those kids and uh, work through us in that way. 
But another thing that has uh, changed since we went back to Northern Ireland was that we went, well, I started here without a wife. I got a wife. <laughs> we went back to Northern Ireland without any kids, and uh, four boys came along. Now, those four boys, when we, when we decided to start a family, that wasn't as easy as it sounds. And there can be trials and there can be difficulties that you don't realize are there. But again, God has a plan. And that plan is hope and it's future. And through having the boys, he showed us the hope that we have and he's shown us the future. And bringing up boys is different than being involved in kids' clubs. Because when you're involved with kids' clubs, come 8, 9 o'clock in the evening, you can leave them to somebody else. It's a bit like when I was babysitting for Paul and Gloria. You could wind the boys up as high as you want, but at half 10, you left. <laughs> and it was their problem to get them to sleep. So you now have kids that you're, that, that you're own responsibility for. And again... You look at the Bible, and what the Bible says in Deuteronomy is that it's a parent's, it's a father's responsibility to instruct your family in the way that it's to be brought up. The Bible says that we're to talk through how God blesses you, how God directs you, how God shows you the future. With your kids, you don't leave it until they're 13, 14, 15, and you think that they can understand. Because even at two, three, they have an understanding that is simplistic, but it's simplistic to a point that it makes it easier to explain how God can do amazing things through his power and through his spirit. So with the four boys, God has blessed the time that you put into them, is shown by how they see God and how they relate to God. And bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That song that the song, in their simplicity, in the, I'm not going to make a fortune being their band manager. <laughs> they're, not, they're not going to be the next big boy band from Ireland. But they have a simplicity and a trust there that shows that in singing, bless the Lord, O my soul, that they're wanting to bless the Lord. And it's up to us to give an opportunity for kids to really demonstrate what God is doing to them and through them so that when they grow older, they realize that God is alive and God wants to be involved in their lives. Now, over the, that's from a family point of view. What has happened to us over the last couple of years from a, a family situation, i let on explain how we've uh, had our difficulties in terms of her dad dying, and then a whole generation of his family passing away over the last year and a half. So there is difficulty. It, it isn't that God protects you in a bubble wrap and you can busy pop away and enjoy yourself with the bubbles and everything else uh, just avoids you. There are difficulties and there are trials. I'm not going to say very much because I think Trevor said, but I suppose really um, it has been a difficult couple of years. Um, um, but I had the, the blessing of uh, being brought up in a, in a, a really godly um, Christian family. And I think uh, this is what I should share today is the importance of, um, you know, when God has promises that we hold of them. And it doesn't mean that they will be fulfilled, only are fulfilled if we're obedient, okay? And um, my dad was one of nine, and really each one of them are a godly soul, I mean, just holy and just lovely, and my dad passed away, and then within, as Trevor said, f five of them all passed away very close together, but one thing that's remarkable is that Trevor said that having the boys was not easy, but the Lord had um, given me scripture, and after I'd had my first 
um, miscarriage. He gave me a scripture in Isaiah that I would be blessed um, with sons, and one would be called Jacob and whatever. And he gave me a, that I knew that I would have four. And whenever I had the first miscarriage, then no. And then after I had Matthew, I had an atopic pregnancy. <coughs> and again, the scriptures came, and I knew um, that I was going to have. So we had, God just blessed us. But for a purpose, God's given us four boys, and they just come one after the other. And I just knew there. So when God has a call in your life, you must be obedient and thankful. But God's so powerful. Uh, and it's not of us. His power and his spirit. It's all about that. We can, anything can happen. And I think we're in a generation now that um, don't know God. It's not been taught by the grannies and grandas because really we've missed a generation. And we need... God's spirit and his power like never before. And uh, I believe that we've been set in a place uh, in Ballymena. And there's a group of us, uh, we've just a new church. And it's not Ballymena needs any more churches because we searched our hearts. But God called us out of an Elam church. And we're very much have spent the last year just seeking after God, praying for the power of his spirit to move in our country, in our city, but we believe it's going to be global. And we just are praying that the churches will just be set alight for God and his spirit would move in his people first of all and that they would just uh, move out for God uh, because uh, we need to see, the people need to see God's power. They need to see healings. They need to see, they just need to see God's power. Uh, and it's humbling to believe. It is humbling, but that starts just, just looking after God's presence. And as we have God's presence in our lives, that's just going to spill over. And that is just my prayer that each one of us, each one of us, just are filled with God's presence. Because you know what? That's, that's what he's chosen to use at this point in history us to carry his presence. God bless. Thanks. <clears throat> well, it's a little different this morning, isn't it? I think when they get good value for money, five sermons for the price of one this morning. <laughs> but I think God is speaking to us as a church. He's reminding us, you know, what we've achieved in the past. But I think he's challenging us for the future. <clears throat> We'll get on. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that we've heard this morning. Lord, we just ask that you will give a special blessing to those who have spoken to us this morning and to Ian, who is now about to speak to us. Lord, just go with them on their journeys. And we thank you, Lord, for the other visitors we've got from Milton Keynes and Tina, Phil and Tina from, I forget where, Lord, but down south. Just bless this time, Lord, and speak to us again, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So am I switched on? Yeah, good. Um, before I start, just um, Trevor and Anne, uh, if you do talk to them over coffee, do ask Trevor about the time that he was stopped by the police uh, for driving a car with Irish plates about half past 11 at night, and uh, when they looked in the boot, there was a, sus a suspicious package. So I won't say any more. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a great privilege uh, to be here, and uh, over the 23 years since, uh, since we left, uh, I will say, I will confess that uh, we have gone to the dark side, Helen and I. Uh, we are now Church of England. <laughs> but uh, we have uh, joined a fantastic fellowship there, and we've had such fantastic teaching, because within the Church of England, there is a, bra a branch of evangelical Christians who are really, uh, really going for the gospel. And so do pray for the church because it is the church of the nation and uh, it's what people see as the church. So do pray for that and do pray for the, the evangelicals. Life is short. Have an affair. 
This is the strap line for the Ashley Madison website. Ashley Madison, the world's leading married dating service, according to their own website. The website that was hacked recently, resulting in the personal details of lots of people who are having illicit affairs being leaked. Six words that express so much about, the, about humanity and the society and the culture that we live in. Life is short. So we have got to get the most out of it, the most fun, the most personal satisfaction. I have to make sure that what I do, that I do what I want so that I get the most out of life. One thing about the statement is true. Life is short. So what does this actually mean for me? What is the meaning of life and what impact does this have on the way that I live my life? 2,000 years ago, Thessalonica was a bustling seaport at the head of the Thermaic Gulf in Macedonia in the north of Greece. It was an important communication and trade center located at the junction of the Great Ignatian Way and the road leading north to the Danube. It was the largest city in Macedonia and was also the capital of its province. Now in the Bible, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the, the Acts of the Apostles tell us about the birth of the church in Thessalonica. Paul, more commonly known as Saint Paul, a Jewish zealot who had been persecuting the Christian church before being confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus and turning to become probably the most famous preacher of the Christian message, visited Thessalonica and began his ministry there in the Jewish synagogues, converting some of the Jews to believe that Jesus is the Messiah or Savior that the Jewish scriptures prophesied would come from God. However, the Jews mostly did not accept this message, and therefore Paul took the message out to the locals. And what we see was that the church was largely made up of Greeks in membership as they turned away from their pagan worship to accept Jesus as Lord. Now, Paul's visit wasn't very long. Some of the Jews stirred up the crowds against Paul, and he left Thessalonica rather abruptly. So Paul, therefore, wrote letters to the church to encourage them and to remind them of the things that they'd been taught about Jesus, particularly in regard to the resurrection of Jesus after he'd been killed on the cross, and that Jesus would return again to destroy evil and restore God's kingdom, of which they were now part. This morning, I would like to look at uh, part of the first letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. The section of the letter is towards the end and deals with this central theme. So the reading comes from chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, Destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, we are doing this morning. Life is short. The early church was eagerly expecting the return of Jesus within their lifespan, 
which led to a few misconceptions. So Paul therefore wrote to the church to help them by giving them information about Jesus' second coming, showing them their association with Jesus in that coming, and finally, Trevor and Anne pointing towards their destination with Jesus as a result of his coming. It is a great letter of encouragement to the early church and to us in keeping our eyes fixed on the future and what that means in our short lives. Now, the reason Helen and I are here in Gateshead this morning is because we received a card through the post with an an invitation to a very special event. The card was very typical in that it was laid out neatly, telling us what it is, an invitation to a party, where it will happen, St. Luke's Church, Newcastle. Why? To celebrate Paul and Gloria's 40 years of marriage. And by the way, it's today, so congratulations, Paul and Gloria. And who is invited? Helen and Ian. It also provided another and very important piece of information. When? Yesterday, Saturday, 19th of September. Now, every Christmas, Helen and I hold a party for a large group of our neighbors and friends. And every year, we prepare invitations. These invitations hold the same form of information. But the piece that Helen and I put the most effort into the one piece we spend a lot of time in preparation is deciding when. When is the best time to have the party? What date? What time? Paul reminds the Christians in Thessalonica that they know what is going to happen. Jesus will return. They know why it will happen. Because God will bring his justice, dealing with sin once and for all, putting an end to evil. They know where every eye will see, which means that the whole world is part of this great event. And they know who is invited. But the question is, when will it happen? One thing they know for certain is that they don't know. Even Jesus, when he was asked by the, the disciples about the end times, declared that he did not know the time. The disciple Matthew And his witness account tells us the words Jesus spoke. Sorry, have we we been there? I haven't been, I don't, like Rob, I haven't got eyes in the back of my head, so I haven't been able to catch up with the, uh, what's, so. So Matthew wrote, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus knew he did not know, even though he is the Son of God. But he is teaching us to trust in God's authority. What a contrast between this admission and and that of the world in which we live. We revere the knowledge and wisdom of men such as Brian Cox, Now, Cox tells us that the universe began 13.7 billion, 75, sorry, got to get the decimal point in there, 13.75 billion years ago with the Big Bang. He tells us that our sun was formed 4.57 billion years ago and is in the middle of its life, fusing hydrogen into helium at a rate of around 600 million tons every second. It will continue to do this for another 5 billion years. As the stores of hydrogen run dry, the sun's core will collapse and momentarily, as helium begins to fuse into oxygen and carbon, a last release of energy will cause its outer layers to expand. The fiery surface of our star will move beyond Mercury towards Venus and onwards to our fragile world. The world thinks it knows when the world will come to an end. We know that it's about five billion years So actually, that makes it okay to continue living the way we are. Live for today. No problem. But Jesus is pointing us to the fact that God is not going to let that happen. He cannot and will not allow evil to go unpunished. He is planning now and he knows when. If we go back to the passage... 
Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And Paul goes on, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. There's a well-worn story that has been passed around the ages about a debate between an atheist professor and a young God-fearing student about the existing existence of God. It goes along the lines of, the professor says, if God created everything, then God created evil, since evil exists. And according to the principle that our works define who we are, then God is evil. The professor boasted to the students that he had proven once more that the Christian faith was a myth. A student raises his hands and says, Can I ask you a question, professor? Of course, replied the professor. The student stood up and asked, Professor, does cold exist? What quite kind of a question of the, what kind of a question is this? Of course it exists. Have you never been cold? The young man replied, In fact, cold does not exist. According to the laws of physics, what we consider cold is in, in reality the absence of heat. Every body or object is susceptible to study when it has or transmits energy. And heat is what makes a body or matter have or transmit energy. At absolute zero, minus 273 degrees Celsius, is the abs total absence of heat. All matter becomes inert and incapable of reaction at that temperature. Cold does not exist. We have created this word to describe how we, ha how we feel when we have no heat. The student continues, Professor, does darkness exist? The professor responded, of course it does. The student replies, once again you are wrong. Darkness does not exist either. Darkness is in reality the absence of light. Light we can study, but not darkness. In fact, we can use Newton's prism to break white light into many colors and study the various wavelengths of each color. You cannot measure darkness. A simple ray of light can break into a world of darkness and illuminate it. How can you know how dark a certain space is? You measure the amount of light present. Isn't this correct? Darkness is a term used by man to describe what happens when there is no light present. Actually, both the student and the professor are right. Darkness does not exist. As the student states, it is where the light is not present. But as the professor states, it is a, really, it is a very real phenomenon and one that we know. We recently holidayed in a house in France uh, where during the night it was pitch black. You could not see a thing. So we ended up plugging in a kiddie nightlight uh, as we were stumbling around the room with mobile phones trying to find their way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Now this is the way that Jesus describes the world. It is a place of darkness. We only have to look around us and see the evil and darkness in the world. This is the way he described the effect of evil and sin in the world. Now, it is easy for us to look around the world around us and point out the evil and darkness that we see. But we have to be careful in judging others because the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and have all fallen short of God's glory. In light of God's holiness, we are darkness now, we have a, a mnemonic that we use with the children to explain this, which is shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules, S-I-N, sin. When we leave God out of our lives, we refuse to live in a way that honors and glorifies him, then we are sinful. Then Jesus, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second is this, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Anything that we do that goes against this, all of the selfish behaviors that we are so guilty of are sin. And this separates us from God and puts us in darkness. Jesus also tells us that because of our sin, God will judge the world. 
we will face the consequences of our sin. But the good news is that because God so loved the world, He has not been content to sit back and allow that to happen, but has provided a solution to the problem by taking on the punishment Himself through Jesus Christ. By believing in Him, He provides forgiveness. Not because He's such a nice chap, because He has taken the punishment that was ours under God's judgment. And when we accept that He has done so and come to Him, He forgives us. Coming to church or associating with Christian people is not the answer. It is only when we make that personal commitment that we are His. And in so doing, He brings His light into our lives. And we become, as the Christians in Thessalonica were, children of light. Light is a wonderful thing because it shows us how things really are. So have you ever been into a nightclub during the day? I remember being at Spring Harvest one year at uh, at Butlins in Skegness. In fact, I think um, Paul's son, Jonathan, was was on the sound desk that night. And uh, we went uh, to an evening concert where the venue seemed really good. It was lots of loud music and lights. It was great. We had a great evening, but the next day we went back to the same venue for a talk. And seeing the venue in the light of day was an altogether different experience. The walls were grubby from years of wear and tear, and the carpets were shabby and beer-stained. The light illuminates. It helps us to see things for what they really are. So when we accept Jesus as our Savior and He brings His light into our lives, He starts to show us how sinful we are and reveals to us just how holy God is. But if we have turned to God by accepting His gift of salvation, rescue from the coming judgment, Christ's return should not take us by by surprise. But for those who continue to live their lives in isolation from God, it will come as a surprise. It will happen like a thief in the night. It will come when they least expect it. We may think that we may be lucky, the thief won't come. So Paul emphasizes the gravity of the reality of this by using another metaphor, the pregnant woman. When a woman is pregnant, she knows labor pains will come. The question is not whether or not it will happen, but is, is she ready? She must, be, she must be delivered of the child. There is no going back. In the same way, Jesus will return. So Paul then takes his readers into an explanation of the association that these Christians in Thessalonica have with Jesus when he returns. So back to the passage in verse 5. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Having received the light of, Christ, of Jesus, if you were a Christian, it tells us that we do not belong to the darkness. We are no longer bound to the darkness of this world and the sin that prevails. We have a new ownership. We are under new management We belong to Christ. We belong to the day. This then should affect the way that we behave. Paul is trying to encourage these new Christians to allow the future to shape the present. And we need to be encouraged and daily encouraging one another to do likewise. Now Paul uses these two examples to guide us in how we should be or how we should not be. We are not to be asleep or drunk. Now, what is the similarity between these two states? In both conditions, we are unconscious of what is going on around us. Hitting the bottle is often triggered by a desire to forget. It is a form of escapism from reality. But getting drunk is a very present focused activity as it provides escape from what is now. But sobriety is a tomorrow-focused activity. It is being prepared for what is to come. In sleep, we are dead to the world. 
Every morning I get up before Helen does and I sneak into the bathroom next to our room. But when I get in there, I switch on the light, which starts a very noisy fan. Then I usually switch the shower on. And yes, contrary to popular belief, I do wash. Um, which is a, a power shower attached to the wall between the, ba- the bathroom and the bedroom. And it makes a pretty racket. But so many times, I can, Helen will tell me that evening that she didn't even hear me go in the morning. She can sleep through anything. So much is said about those who slumber, missing what is going on about them. If you are, and uh, Trevor and Anne, you've got this to come. If you are or have been the the parent of a teenager, I'm sure that you are familiar with the lack of action uh, of things that need to be done because your offspring is asleep. And how often do we find that they waste the whole day by sleeping? The day is a time for action. It is a time for getting things done to prepare for the future. So back to verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Paul frequently uses metaphors of battle and sporting events to uh, sporting achievement to describe the life of a Christian uh, while we live this life on earth. Paul encouraged the church at the start of his letter in chapter 1, verse 3. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Their faith is seen in the work and the labor of love and endurance. It is not a passive acceptance of Jesus as Savior, but it's an active one. We should be actively waiting for Christ's return. Be sober, not be fuddled, not confused, but with clear minds, awake and alert, not sleeping. It is inappropriate for children of the day to behave as children of the night. In the witness account of Luke in the Bible, he recounts the birth of John the Baptist, a prophet who prepared the way for Jesus to come. When John was born, his father Zechariah sang a song. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. And then down to verse 79, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Whilst John was a special case in that he was actually preparing the way for the physical Jesus, the song equally applies to us if we belong to Jesus. We bring his light into the world so that we might guide the people's feet into the path of peace. Matthew records for us Jesus' words, You are like the light of the world. A town built on a a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. If we live in Christ, then we are those who are the light of the world. Lighthouses are set high so everyone can see them. They are fitted with lenses to project the light to warn the people of the danger that lies beneath We bring light that guides, light that warns, light that reveals. We must put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet and get out there into the world and to take the light of the world into the world. Now, this isn't taking our light, letting our light shine, but it is allowing Christ's light to shine through us. We are the lighthouse. He is the light. And as I come to they close. I'd ask the band if they want to start making their preparations. So finally, just looking at verse 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Paul is directing the Thessalonian church to their destination. The whole purpose of Jesus' death, resurrection, and return is that we might live together with him forever. The whole of God's plan is that man will live in harmony and perfection with God. This has been the plan from the start. 
But sin and man's rebellion, his selfishness and arrogance has got in the way and caused a rift between God and man. For this, the natural outcome is that God will mete out his justice. But Paul reminds the church, you have seen the light. You have turned away from your sinful lives and turned to Jesus, seeking his forgiveness. In so doing, they are assured that their final destiny is not one of wrath and destruction, but acceptance into God's family to be with him forever. Whether we are awake or asleep is largely understood to refer to those Christians who have died before Christ returns. This was a worry to the church, the early church, because they were expecting Jesus to return in their lifetime. So what happens if, he comes, if they die before he comes back? Paul is reassuring them that those who are still alive when Jesus returns and those who have died believing will all be restored into God's people to live with him under his rule and authority. At the end of the previous chapter, just before the passage we have looked at this morning, Paul wrote the following words. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, uh, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, as we have, we've had this morning, encourage one another with these words. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn away from your sins. Seek his forgiveness, and this will be your destiny too. We may think that we can predict the future, but Jesus will return. And he will return when we least expect it. So we need to be ready. If we are His, we are His light in the world. And we need to be letting that light shine to guide, to warn, and to illuminate. If we are His, we have a wonderful and glorious future. Therefore, let's allow the future to guide the present and live in preparation for that day. Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.